Hello, everyone. This is another Freedom to Feel conversation, and my guest today is Dr. Hossein Koros Mayer. He's an author and physician scientist who has spent over two decades in cancer research and drug development. So you also have published two novels, Extinction Six and Project Bodhi, Awaken the Power of Insight, which you mentioned in your book, Big Breakthrough Two. That, may, that got me curious. So I have lots of questions as of now, but the, the full bio will be at the end of this video. The first question that I love asking, and I try to break away from that at, at some point, but it's still coming to me as a message, I, I guess it has to do with belief systems and who we believe, we believe ourselves to be. So I have to ask this opening question. Um, who are you in your own words as of this moment? I love that you mentioned belief system. Yeah. I'm somebody who used to be, used to be an academic uh, with a belief system that centered around me and, and my promotion and ego and all of that. Um, but I've come over the last couple of years to realize there is something far bigger than me out there. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing is that now the science is leading us to where, you know, religion and spirituality have been all along which is an understanding of, uh, first of all, an understanding of the brain, how the brain actually works, and coming to realize that we have two primary networks in our brain. One is called default mode network. It's the, the mm -hmm. purpose of this book. But another called central executive, where the, the belief system around that is, is basically my belief system an expansive consciousness, mm. a realization that we are all interrelated, all, all, living being, all living beings, and living for a purpose far bigger than me. So my purpose in writing this book is to genuinely help other people and give them the tools they need to uh, really break through to a, to a happier place, basically. Yeah. So um, you just mentioned expanded awareness coming from that. Um, it, See, it looks like there are two different kinds of um, place to come from in a sense of perception and perspective. But there's only one, really, Vai Hussein. That's my understanding from Vedanta, that there is just one reality, not two. So how do you, what does it look like from your perspective? How do you see reality from that expanded, ex expanded uh, consciousness, awareness? Yeah. So... I think the question is, who are we like in our, in our minds, the way our minds actually work? Um, where is the real I, the real me? Yeah. Um, and so I don't know, anytime you're observing, you're sort of observing yourself, observing your thoughts, that observing mind, that's the yeah. real you, right? The observing mind that is able to see thoughts come and go. Um, but for many of us, we're trapped in those thoughts. We're trapped in that default mode network, which is um, sort of the, the dual, the part of the brain that creates duality, right? So let's, let's take a closer look at these two parts of the brain. The default mode network, what is it? it it's actually your, it's your wandering mind, uh, which yeah. you'll recognize when your mind wanders away from the present. And um, it is basically the primitive part of our brain. It's, it's what has gotten here, gotten us here to this point. Um, its belief system revolves around me and it makes decisions based on that perception of me and yeah. good versus evil relative to how it impacts me. So that duality is created by this primitive part of our brain, the, the default mode network. Um, and it gets us into a lot of problems, right? Things like anxiety and depression and emotional pain, addiction, yeah. a lot of issues stem from this default mode network. In contrast, that central executive part of our brain, the observing mind, it is fully present, able to see that all of life is in, interrelated, mm -hmm. interconnected yeah. um, in this non-duality. Um, and so by tuning into that state, and th the thing is we have a name for these things now. It makes it more objective to explain to somebody who doesn't know what we're talking about right. when we can show, take a look at this MRI scan of this patient who has an overactive default mode network, when they see the image, it's a little easier to grasp. So that's the one of the purposes I wrote this book, yeah. 
Yes, yes. And that's one of the questions that I usually ask. You already answered my question. What's the purpose? So is there such a thing as a um, healthy default mode network? I would yes. love to hear because at the end of the book, I, I see that you mentioned that you use the word yeah, healthy. Absolutely, there is. Yeah. And I, I can tell you from personal experience, there is. Um, first of all, a lot of times when we're meditating or praying and that default mode network turns on and we remember the past gives us some pain or we think about the future gives us some anxiety. Yeah. It's natural to get angry at that or to blame that or to want to get rid of that. That's not the right way of doing it. The right way of doing it is recognizing your default mode network mm -hmm. as something that's trying to help you. It's trying to help you think about the past to process, to move on. It's trying to think about the future to help you get ready for it. So, forming a new relationship with this default mode, having gratitude for it when it shows up and being happy when you're in that observing mind helps you form a healthy relationship with this default mode network. We all need a healthy DMN to be happy and successful. And it is not possible to get rid of it and nor should you want to get rid of it because Bye. unfortunately, patients with Alzheimer's disease, patients with dementia, don't have a default mode network. They're not able to process information. They're not able to get through the day. So we do need a healthy DMN. And yes, it is possible to change the relationship with it so it works for you and not against you. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm grateful. Every time my mind wanders away to the future, I'm grateful because I realize it's trying to help me. Uh, I wasn't like this two years ago, <laughs> two, three years ago. Yes. I was consumed in that place, which was a painful, painful way to live. Right. Yes. Uh, it has been my case too. Yeah. Coming from trauma. And then it, um, and then I got into spirituality. There was my, um, my path to try to solve those issues. Um, that was clearly getting in the way of happiness, peace and all that. But I see now after 15 years that they're still here. So, they come and go because I learned to do exactly that, to let them come, just observe them and then let them go. But sometimes I get caught though. And, and I see, but I don't, there's no emotions, no really, uh, let's say fuel. So it's the, it's, it's almost as if the fire has been just turn it down. It's not really to just smoke them, but I still feel though, I still have that. You know, the, the impact of that, the, the, the memory of the past still comes to haunt me from time to time. So I wonder, because I talked to a lot of psychologists here too. So I wonder if that, from your perspective, does it ever go away actually? Or this is a practice for life, this um, of observing and letting it go? Yeah, I'm well, just wondering. Yeah, the, the mind will, in a healthy person, the mind will always wander. Now, the question is, when it wanders, does it give you pain? that part of it you can fully yeah. fully resolve the, the aspect of the pain so emotional pain is one of the chapters it's the second not i don't call them disorders and syndromes and defects i call them knots like knots in a rope which yeah. you can untie there it's reversible so coming from science from a science angle what happens with emotional pain you have the default mode network goes to the past revisits the past and a memory pops up. Memory is actually called an yeah. engram. It's actually a signal in the brain. And when that memory comes up, any emotion attached to that memory can come up and you can relive that emotion. And patients with post-traumatic stress disorder, they're living with that emotion all mm -hmm. the time. So what you have to try to do is break that link between the memory and the emotion. And how do you do that? So many different ways of doing that, but things, I'm sure you know all of these, but radical acceptance, working with a therapist and fully accepting the past, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, for me, it's the power of forgiveness, right? Truly forgiving what happened, uh, which may yeah. be very difficult if you've had a, you know, traumatic memories, but fully living through the past, accepting it and forgiving what happened you can permanently resolve that emotional pain. I'm sure you know all about this. But, um, but yeah, the default mode will go back to those memories. And life is unpredictable. New traumas yeah. happen all the time, unfortunately. It's the, and so having resilience 
and being prepared for those moments when they come will, will, will help you. So a lot of us don't want change. We're very stubborn to change. But when yeah. we come to ex- recognize that life is impermanent, there is always change developing your resilience. You can use that pain as the fuel. You mentioned fuel, the fuel to take you to that to that higher self, yeah. Yes, yes, beautifully said. You also mentioned uh, communicating with the divine. That was one of the techniques, and that was probably the first one that I used (laughs) before forgiveness, self-forgiveness, acceptance. I remember um, always communicating with the unknown. That was always um, something that, for some reason, it was natural to me to do. Every time pain arised, emotional pain, I would just talk to plants. I would go outside and look at the sky and just ask questions. And, you know, I, I wanted answers. So for some of us, it seems like it's very natural to just do that, to be more, I would say, mystical in a way. Look, trying to, it's almost as we already see through things, through the physical reality, and we're just going through them and trying to see something beyond that. That has been my case since I was very little. And maybe that's why I took, after the trauma and all that, I took the, the path of spirituality and that has informed the way I, I see reality these days. And with that in mind, in your book, you, you do raise the question about enlightenment. Uh, what is enlightenment? You asked that question. So I'd love for you to answer that question here. A lot of people are interested in this big yeah. word. I, I rarely use it, but what is enlightenment to yeah. you? Well, It originally came from Buddha, obviously. He talked about the process of awaking, like waking up from a bad dream and realizing my suffering is gone. He didn't really describe what is enlightenment. He didn't talk about the positive qualities. He just talked about what you have to overcome for it to to happen, dukkha, dissatisfaction. And so people haven't had a good understanding of what exactly is enlightenment. Um, the Enlightenment movement in Europe was something very different. It was, um, it was a more scientific progress. And Rene Descartes and Isaac Newton and all of the amazing science and technology that came out of it. But the, you know, so going back to what Buddha was talking about, enlightenment is the process of replacing any darkness within with light. When you look inside, mm-hmm. and only you can look inside, right? When you look inside, is there darkness or is there light? I mean, for me, most of my life, when I looked inside, there, there wasn't light. There was um, a desire to succeed. There was um, cravings and aversions and judgments. And yeah, on paper, I was very successful. Um, you know, all got, got a medical school and all of that. But I recognized that there wasn't light inside. And so yeah. coming to the, the process of, turning on that light and turning off that darkness, that is enlightenment. And people who are enlightened, they're, they're fully present to, you know, to experience life as it truly is. They're, they're happy with life as it truly is, even if life is difficult, because there is this connection with something bigger, yeah. a connection with a higher power. Um, and so enlightened people tend to be compassionate. They tend to be altruistic, patient, They tend to do what's right, even if no one's watching, because they recognize that makes them happy. For me, when I give to others, when I'm compassionate, even if no one's around, just the intention of wanting to help others, I feel happier inside. And so that's how I would describe enlightenment. It's it's just having light inside. I remember interviewing somebody recently, too. We're talking about enlightenment. And he said, it's also somebody who has a scientific mind. That's very important. Not to believe in anything. It's not about faith or belief systems. It's about truth. So it's very scientific. It's looking for truth. So that caught my attention too. I didn't think about enlightenment in that way, but it makes sense, doesn't it? I love that you said truth. So what is truth? And what is reality? What is the nature of reality? Mm, So here is reality. We are living on this planet. Um... And in this galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, where we have hundreds of billions of stars, and it is estimated that there are 100 quintillion planets out there. That's reality, (laughs) what we're seeing. Now, what does that even mean? That number is so big, we don't even understand it. So if planet Earth, here's to give you a sense of that. If planet Earth was one grain of sand, one grain of sand, 
There are more planets in the universe than all the grains of sand in all the beaches of Earth. That is how small Earth is. That is the nature of reality. And yet yeah. we think that the universe revolves around us or it revolves around humanity. And that might make you feel very small, but then you have to consider the miracle that is us as living beings with yeah. each of us having a hundred trillion cells. So that's like a thousand star, a thousand Milky Way galaxies, the number of stars in a thousand Milky Way galaxies. That's how many cells make up each of us as beings. So reality is just far more complex than, than our minds are able to, to achieve and to understand. And I think Buddha had the term emptiness. Yes. When that non-duality, when you can just observe reality for the glory that it is without having any concept, because as soon as you have a concept for it, it's already wrong. Uh, <laughs> Our brain yes. is not able to form a concept of the universe. So just looking at it and Leonardo da Vinci said, learn how to see and recognize that everything is interrelated. And when you, uh, you know, and when you have those moments of awe, when you can look at the universe and just see it without forming an opinion of it, you can get a glimpse of just how grand it is and how, how miraculous it is that, that we're around. Hmm. I interview, um, you probably know him or maybe you're not. He's a known, Robert Wolf is a known non-duality teacher. Mm -hmm. And he said that the moment you close your eyes means in losing this body, that's the world also disappears because that's what it just existed because of you. So that not you, you as the, the ego, right? You as the universal consciousness, pure consciousness. Yeah, that's so beautiful. that's, I mean, the mind cannot even, um, yeah, it cannot really comprehend that. But I just love those concepts. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's a lot of fun to talk about it even. It's Absolutely. playful. You know, there, I understand exactly what you're saying. Um, but there are most people out there um, don't either don't get it or don't seem to care. Hmm. And um, yeah. I think a lot of people out there want to see some data or science backing <laughs> any sort of <laughs> yeah. claim. And until now, it's been difficult to have any sort of uh, scientific basis of, of what you just said until hmm. now, because now we are understanding this, this amazing brain of ours and recognizing that what people have called the higher self and the observer it's called the central executive network. Connections between the prefrontal cortex and the parietal cortex that you can see on an MRI. And when you're in that state, when you're in that observer state, you're in the zone. It's called the flow state where you're fully present. There's no mental chatter. That mental chatter yeah. is off. Yeah. And you can fully be here and use your senses and be present. Um, and you can also when you're in that state, recognize your default mode network when it shows up rather than being stuck in it and being in that state of reactive judgmental thinking where you're in the past and future and never in the present. So yes. I think this part of it might make it more accessible to more people, people who are, I don't know, doctors, scientists, lawyers, people who want to know, want to understand something scientifically makes it a little more objective. But. Yes, yeah. And, then, and one of the things that attracted me to Advaita Vedanta is that it's exactly that. It's science and spirituality. They really, I mean, it's so sophisticated the way they explain the absolute reality and how it's not that it interacts with the physical realities. That the physical reality, obviously, it's making, it seems to have, um, it feels like everything's happening in the body. Uh, consciousness is here somewhere, located somewhere in the body, in the brain somewhere. But we have no proof of that. We, I don't think science can ever prove that. Well, yes. I, I, yeah. You know, when I was um, 24 years ago, um, we were sequencing the human genome. And back then we were debating, is there, are there 80,000 genes, 100,000 genes? And there were all these debates and people had all these you know, different ideas. And now we understand there's 20,000 genes. We've sequenced the genes. We know what the genes do. There's no need to, to question. 
the brain we're just starting to understand now. And it, it reminds me a lot of 25 years ago with the genome. And what I'm seeing now, people are debating, are there seven networks in the brain? Are there eight? Are there nine? And there are all these yeah. debates happening because we're just now understanding the brain. My prediction, I think over the next 10, 20 years, we're going to really we're going to have developments here that we can't imagine right now. New medicines also, I think that can silence this default mode network without all of the side effects that you see with like plant medicines. And yeah. I think it's hard to even imagine our growth in the next one or two decades, but it's an exciting time to be alive and to see science and spirituality, even sitting at the same table, that alone is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes, Hussein, I agree. How did you come to this spiritual understanding of yourself at some at mm -hmm. some point you had this um those in deeper insights through experience how did that happen i'm curious yeah. to know i grew up you know my my mom is um practicing sufi actually so i'm yeah. um she you know and i remember taking meditation classes as a seven-year-old, eight-year-old, not really understanding what yeah. I was doing, <laughs> but getting yeah. some exposure to that at a young age. Um, and I think later on um, in high school, as I read about Buddhism, uh, there's something just resonated with me, although I didn't quite fully grasp the concepts until just a few years ago in my 40s. But, you know, that fir the first book I wrote, Project Bodhi, Bodhi actually refers to the Bodhi tree. It's, right, it's a novel. Right. It's a futuristic novel, actually. But the core, some of the core messages in the book are about, um, you know, innovation and, and harnessing, you know, your, your brain, basically. But this is something I've been very interested in for a very long time. And, um, and, and what prompted me to write this book were the advancements in science that's happening. Yeah. There's something in your book that caught my attention. The Project Bodhi, that book, of course, I didn't read the book, the, the, the novel, but the breakthrough book, that's mm -hmm. under uh, addictive craving. You say one of the surrender to a higher power, psychedelics will help too, I just made. And then th there's a concept, I think, has to do with psychedelics in the book that you mentioned. I talk about in my book, Awaken the Power of Insight, uh, Project Bodhi. So... I would love to hear a little bit more about that, this idea of surrendering. Um, I mean, that's another interesting concept, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, so I, I mentioned before there are, again, I call them knots, like knots in a rope, 11 knots in this book. And stress is number one, emotional pain number two. Number three, addictive yeah. craving. So that's my term for addiction. It's a little softer term. Addictive craving is just craving that is harmful, that's harming you or others around you. It could be things like alcohol. It could be uh, a craving for money or power or status or title or, you know, and, and so yeah. the process of addictive craving, you know, only you know if it's causing you unhappiness. And if it is, then I think the first step is, first of all, having the intention, right, of wanting to be uh, happier, right, mm -hmm. having that intention is very important. Many of us don't actually want to change. We're perfectly fine <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. with our cravings, which is fine. You're free to live however you like. But if you have an intention of wanting something better, take a look inside and try to, first of all, recognize this, this ego, this default mode network, and, and ask yourself, you know, are you, what do you see inside? And um, if you, you know, if you recognize that these cravings have taken over, then it's very important to surrender. So surrender just means admitting to yourself that these cravings for money, titles, whatever it may be, they're not working. They're not bringing you fulfillment. Maybe you've bought your first house, second house, and you bought a third house or bought a third car or whatever, hoping it would bring fulfillment. It hasn't. So rather than thinking, maybe I need a fourth car, or fifth car, looking inside and asking, Am I trapped in addictive craving? Could that be the actual problem? And so surrendering that ego, recognizing that this default mode has taken over the brain and surrendering to a higher power to lead you out of that. Um, now, that for some people, that higher power is God. For other people, the higher power is the Dharma, the nature of reality as it's happening now. Uh, for some people, it's their subconscious mind, their deeper mind which will yeah. give them the insights to, to lead out of that darkness. 
but surrendering is a first step. And then it's developing that insight, that insightful awareness, waiting for that higher power to give you those insights to lead you out of that darkness and listening when those insights show up. So St. Augustine said, God provides the wind, but man must raise his sails. So when those insights come, you have to act. You have to listen and you have to act. It may be uncomfortable, but follow what your higher power is, is guiding you because mm. it's very common to relapse back into that darkness. How do you make sense of suffering? Uh, what is the, what would you say is the cause of all suffering? Do you go back to Buddha? Um, life basically suffering, he said, but do you see the underlying cause, fundamental cause for suffering? Yeah. So yeah, Buddha had a uh, part of his four noble truths, his first noble truth that life is dissatisfaction. Dukkha is actually the term he used. Um, and yeah. what is the cause of that? And this is where the default mode network pops up again, because what the default mode network is trying to do is to predict how life should unfold. We have expectations about how life should happen based on what's happened in the past or, and what we want yeah. to happen. And that creates suffering when we want things to happen a certain way. We want, we have these expectations. It creates this dissatisfaction. But when you can learn to observe life for what it is, even the bad moments, mm. sometimes I'll have some, you know, I have three young kids, a full-time job, um, very, very busy all the time, but I'm always thankful. I'm always expressing mm. gratitude even during the anxious moments, even during the anxious moments, I say, God almighty, thank you for this moment of being, and I'm going through anxiety. <laughs> uh. And so, yeah. So I think life, just as Buddha said, in the four noble truths, when you learn to let go of craving and aversion and you learn to be with life and accept life for what it is, the suffering comes to an end. That's the principle of Nirvana and blowing out the candle. And, um, and it, it has a basis in understanding how the brain works. It actually helps with that process. So yes. if you are in suffering, use that as the fuel to get you to that higher self. You know, that is a very important, you're actually closer than others to that higher self. If you're going through suffering, take advantage of that, use mm -hmm. it for change. Right? Yes. I remember something about I interviewed um, somebody who came up with um, an interesting idea. He's a scientist too, but it, he does research on the brain and uh, basically trauma. He works with uh, trauma survivors. And he said most of the, the way that we uh, uh, interact with this reality is from outdated brain predictions. So mm -hmm. that was interesting to hear. It's the same thing that you're saying. It's just a different way of saying that. So, and then he explained that way too. And then I interviewed also a, psych a psychiatrist who is a spiritual teacher as well, which is a very interesting mix. And he said, the first thing is just, it's very simple. It's to calm the brain. We need to calm the brain. And I see in your book, you say over and over and over all the practices that you suggest they, they have to do with that mindfulness, meditation, breathing techniques, the surrender, peace, forgiveness, all that has to do with calming the brain. Yeah. So we can get to that state of calm and relaxation. That's right. I mean, again, it's and I'm sure you've done this as well. When you when you just look at yourself and observe the quality of the brain, right, when it's in between thoughts, what is, is the baseline state of our brain one of craving, one of agitation, one of stress? No, it's just like looking at a three-year-old, and I have three young kids. Mm. Their natural state yeah. is blissful. It's calm. It's peaceful. That state of observing, that is our natural state. And craving comes on top of that. It is, I think it's, it's normal to have craving. There's nothing wrong. If we're very tired or we're sick, our body craves sleep. We listen to that craving and we, we feel better. Um, yeah. Our body tells us to crave food and then gives us a signal that we're full. And if we listen to that and we just listen to our body, you know, we won't gain weight actually. So craving, normal craving is a normal part of life. Um, but I think when you connect with that deeper part of the brain, that observing mind, and you can, you can observe cravings come and go, you can observe aversions, observe ignorance, 
Ignorant mm. thoughts come and go all the time. And you come to recognize the blissful nature of, of the brain's resting state. Um, it opens everything up. Yeah. So stress is the first knot in the book. It is a big problem right now all throughout society. Yeah. There's yeah. actual chemicals, as you know, that the brain releases during stress, adrenaline, cortisol. These can damage our bodies, contribute to, unfortunately, things like cancer and heart disease. But by relaxing the mind, releasing GABA, as it's called, this neurotransmitter, we can prevent stress from happening. Um, and so one thing I mentioned in the book, we're all different. We're all wired a little differently. What triggers that relaxation response for you might be a little different for me. Mm, so right. try and right. identify those techniques. Spend 20 minutes, observe your brain, whatever state it's in, observe it. Spend 15, 20 minutes, put the phone away. <laughs> try, you can try mindfulness, try a prayer, try taking a walk, being in nature, getting sunshine, whatever it is, journaling, gardening. And observe your mind after those 15, 20 minutes. You can feel that relaxation. Those practices that work best for you, do more of those. Keep that self-discovery and that intention. Day by day, that momentum grows. And you can prevent stress from happening in the first place. Yes. So loneliness, you say, you mentioned the illusion of self. So that was, um, it caught my attention immediately. So you say we all connected. The air we breathe and the land we inhabit binds us together in in the interconnected web, web of life. So it sounds very poetic too, in a way. You see, I love concepts. I love poetry and I love music. So anything that sounds like that, it just caused my attention, like flower, like nature, you know, in a sense of devotion even. But so I, I love this part in the book. There's so many other parts that I love too, but this really caught my attention because the illusion of self, I think that's why most people feel lonely. You see, and it really goes back to that every time, you know, like you said, it's okay to have the experience as long as we know that that's not what we are. It's okay to have a body and a mind knowing that we are not the body mind. That would change everything. If we, yeah. you see, it's a belief system that we are the body mind. It's not a, it's not a science. It, it can be, although we are also, I mean, this is the manifestation of consciousness, all the bodies, all the minds. I, yeah, I agree. I mean, the COVID-19 pandemic clearly told us that social isolation and loneliness can worsen, you know, mental and physical health. Uh, yeah. We saw a surge of anxiety and depression after, you know, with that COVID-19 pandemic. And I think a lot of people don't realize that loneliness is reversible and um, instead you know, we tend to worsen that loneliness. We tend to blame our loneliness on other people mm -hmm. and make it even worse for us. And so I think when you understand that the, this default mode network creates this illusion that we are different from others, that we are separate from others and contributes to our loneliness, that it's, it's like our primitive brain, right? That got us through living in the jungles and the caves <laughs> long yeah. ago when yeah. life was very hard. Um, that type of that type of thinking got us to this point, but we don't need to rely on that anymore. And you can reverse that loneliness by silencing that default mode network, cultivating things like compassion, mm. right? And sometimes I'll, I'm walking down the street, I see somebody walking. My instinct is to look down, to walk away. But when you challenge that and say, no, I wish the best for this person who I don't even know. Right. And sometimes I'll just have the intention of wanting to help someone. and those any lonely feelings just evaporate when you cultivate that compassion. So loneliness, it can take, believe it or not, 10 or 15 years off of your life. Our Surgeon General has written a book about it. Wow. But you can reverse it. And by reversing it, you will live a happier, longer life. There was a study at Harvard, I'm sure you've heard of this, tracked people over 80 years and found that the best predictor of long life is having close relationships. Yes. It wasn't money. It wasn't cholesterol levels. <laughs> it wasn't yeah, it was yeah. having <laughs> close relationships. That was the best predictor of health. So, and having compassion and empathy for other people helps you build those relationships. So. Yes. And that creates that sense of peace, inner peace. You talk throughout the book. I love how you have that. May 
I, you, you be happy. You, you, you change it uh, throughout the book. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you have peace. And I love the way you talk about peace. You say a strong mind is one that is at peace. I have a heart close to that. Um, yeah, so that's what we're all looking for. Peace, right? Isn't it? And uh, you say inner peace is freedom. Is that your final, let's say, description, definition of freedom? You said? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, so many times in my past, I was chasing things, thinking if, if I were to, to just become, you know, graduate from this place or get this job or find this partner or have this, yeah. I'll finally have that peace. It was all wrong. It was actually inside the journey within finding that inner peace actively every single day, cultivating mm. that mm. until I realized it took about six months, but one day I realized I'm free from all of that pain. It's, it's gone. So yeah, absolutely. Inner peace is freedom. It's absolutely true. So I don't have to ask you the question in the end. I usually ask the question, oh my guests. So what is freedom to you? So this one is very clear. Yeah. Inner peace. I absolutely agree with you within the human experience, the body, mind, I would say that essentially we already peace itself, right? We are already free. So there's nothing really, we don't have to look for it. We are, we are what we are looking for. So I always start with that and everything that I do, I always start there. I am already what I'm looking for. So the crave, the cravings automatically, they, they are, let's say they dissolve. It's so, so interesting to see, you know, they just kind of, they fly away. <laughs> um, every time I have this month, it's like a mantra, you know, I am what I'm looking for. So um, I also want to mention the other knots. So there are 11, 11 mental knots in your book that you, um, I see compassion there, that your work, there's a uh, generosity, compassion, honesty, I, in this desire to help humanity. So we don't want it to get to be free from all desires, right? That's a beautiful one to have. So uh, stress, emotional pain, addictive craving, loneliness, negativity, anxiety and anger, uh, dishonesty and denial, inaction, dissatisfaction, poor lifestyle and resistance to change. So you have all of them there in the book. It's just so clear. It's beautiful done, beautiful work. Thank you. Hussein. Thank you. So um, let me see if there's anything else that I didn't ask. I want to mention your your website. That's yourdefaultmode.com. Are you also on social media, Hussein? Yeah, I'm. All of the links are at the bottom of that page, yourdefaultmode.com. Okay. So yeah, Instagram and TikTok and all of that. Which, by the way, I wasn't on as of two years ago. I only joined it just to spread the word about the book. And uh, but yeah, would love to hear if you have any questions. I love to answer them and yeah yes yes how beautiful um i mean i have to say that because i'm very devotional when it comes to this expression of of humans it's just doing what we i mean we know that's um uh it needs to be done from that perspective and then from the other perspective we're already there so it's a beautiful uh, let's say alignment is not something that's different it's just uh, it's like the sun being reflected in uh, this right. perfect pristine river it's just beautiful thank you so much again for being you absolutely thank you valeria thank you before we say goodbye i wanted to ask you another question though this question here it's it relates to the human experience of course very much what three experiences you wish everyone to to have before they lose the body before they die hmm. i think it's number one would be you know, really seeing the, the the nature of reality that the moments of awe when the mind is silenced and you can look out into the universe and get a glimpse of of just the enormity of, of what's out there. Um, I think you described it as as non duality. You know it when you experience it. Something that just transcends you, um, or the term emptiness. Um, I think that's that's one of the big ones. Um, number two, I would say is the, the idea or the principle of equanimity, mm. where mm. when you can fully, again, it's that observing mind, but being able to see the good and the bad, being at ease with the unease and freeing yourself from that negative judgmental mind, um, that power of equanimity, uh, I, I would say number two. And yeah. I mean, three really, I would say is, is gratitude, having gratitude for for life, for those around you, and just for, for existence. 
I think if more of us can truly actively cultivate it, the world will definitely be a better place. Yeah. Mm, yes, yes, a billion times to that. Um, thank you so much again for sharing timeless wisdom. Thank Absolutely. you. Thanks, Blair. We'll talk soon. Take good care of yourself for now. Bye for now, Hussein.